Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Echoing Green webinar, um, going over opportunities and challenges for developing world local leaders in social entrepreneurship. Um, just to quickly go over the technology here for this webinar, um, some of you have already started asking questions. Thank you for that. Um, there, for those of you who are looking for that, it's a little um, icon in your toolbox on the right hand side of your computer that says questions and you can write a question to us. Um, we will try to address any of the specific questions through the question box so um, either myself or Nate, my colleague here, will, will answer you through the computer. Otherwise, if the question is relevant to everybody, um, we might address it at the end. Um, we also collected your questions um, from the registration and we'll be, um, we'll be addressing most of them uh, when Jessica and Kennedy, who are our fellows who are on the, the webinar today, um, are on and any of the more logistics types questions, uh, if we do have time for them, again, we will address them at the end. So. Again, welcome. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. We'll start with about 15 minutes to go over the Echoing Green Fellowship, um, specifically some pointers for the application itself, as well as um, just a general timeline for the application. And then we'll go into um, 30 to 40 minutes of question and answers with um, Kennedy and Jessica from Shining Hope for Communities who are joining us today on this webinar um, to give their perspective um, on being a local leader in, uh, from the developing world. Um, so again, please ask questions. And for all of you who may be joining late, um, we will repeat this throughout the thing, throughout the webinar, that we will have the uh, webinar recorded and available online for you to download. Um, and hopefully that will be available by Monday. But everyone who registered for this webinar, um, we will send you the link to download those. So um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Nate, who is um, a senior associate for the Fellows Program, um, which is also uh, what I do. Um, Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. My name's Erica. I forgot to, to say that. <laughs> I'm the one who emailed most of you earlier today about the fellowship or about the about the webinar, um, and I am also a senior associate of fellow programs. Um, and then I'll also introduce Kennedy and Jessica from Shining Hope for Communities, and then more formally introduce them when we get to that part. So um, we're just going to get started. Here we go. <laughs> so um, this is just a, a few of our fellows and alumni, and I just wanted to give you a, 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 a small smattering of, of people who we've supported um, who are local leaders in, in um, where they're from. Um, the one on the top left is Ezra El Shafei from Mideast Youth. Uh, her organization connects youth from the Middle East and North Africa online to promote human rights, religious freedom, tolerance, and free speech. Uh, Mideast Youth is um, the only creative space for youth to freely express themselves and exchange information, experiences, views, and opinions um, visibly involving various minorities who have been persecuted, censored, and violently discriminated against for decades. Um, so Ezra, she's certainly a risk taker. She's very creative, and she sees the possibility for a different reality. Um, down at the bottom, we have Javier Lozano from Clinicas del Azúcar. Um, what he's doing in Mexico is establishing a low-cost chain of diabetes clinics to support 90% of the diabetics in Mexico with limited access to treatment centers. Um, so Javier came at this problem with a business mind. He's very solution-oriented and uh, went for the access approach to healthcare. And finally, on your right, you have um, a picture of just a barrel of uh, a cart full of rice, and that um, represents Muhammad Ali Niang and Salif um, from Malo Traders. And what they're doing uh, is fighting extreme poverty and malnutrition in Mali 
by fortifying rice with vital minerals and vitamins, and also connecting these farms to production, processing, and markets. Um, so Muhammad Ali and Salif are both from Mali um, and are tremendous resource magnets. Um, so these are just uh, a few people who I wanted to also highlight what about them as individuals um, made them Echoing Green Fellows. So Echoing Green, uh, we're looking really for powerful and passionate individuals who are capable of carrying out their ideas for social change. Um, they all come to us in various stages um, within the startup phase, uh, but they all have a concrete idea of their goal and also how to accomplish it. Um, it's definitely more about you as the state of the world changer, and we're willing to take a chance on, on your framework of your mission. So next I want to show you um, just a, a map of where we are. Um, we funded fellows all over the world, and whether that's Americans working outside the U.S. or internationals working in their own communities, um, it really could be anyone. Um, regardless of your nationality or citizenship, everyone is welcome to apply for the fellowship. Um, there's just one stipulation, and that is if you're working in the U.S., you must have work authorization. Um, and what's important to note is that we are open to individuals who are working at both or either a global or smaller local scales. So you can do your work at a localized level, and if you have a bold plan to drive change in just one community, it really could be just as compelling as a person who's doing it with a global reach. So it's really more about the innovation um, and the individual. Um, so that said, we do want to see people making change in all parts of the globe, and so our goal is to cover this map with more green dots. Um, and that's where you come in. So now I'm going to pass it over to Nate, who will talk about the fellowship itself. Great. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few details of the fellowship. Um, hopefully this will answer some of the questions that I've seen you guys uh, submitting through the webinar software. And then what we don't get to, um, please continue to ask clarifying questions and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, so the fellowship is a two-year program and there are a number of benefits that come along with it. Uh, the first is an unrestricted investment of $80,000 for individuals and $90,000 for partnerships. So you can apply to the fellowship either as um, a single individual who's founded an organization or two individuals who have co-founded an organization. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, the amount of financial support you get is relatively similar between the two. Um, but for an applicant to be part of a partnership, both of the uh, members of the partnership need to be founders of the organization, and both need to have primary decision-making power, and they both must commit to working at the organization full-time. And this is true for any applicant. You must be working at your organization full-time during the two years of the fellowship. So that's a minimum of 35 hours a week. Um, and the money that uh, comes as part of the fellowship can be spent on anything from programming to salaries, um, whatever it is that the, organ needs and is, the organization needs to fulfill its mission. Um, and we ask fellows to submit budgets throughout the program so that we know how the money is being spent. Another benefit that we give our fellows is we give up to $4,000 a year for health insurance reimbursement because um, we think it's very important for our fellows to stay healthy um, so that they can continue to carry out their intended work. We also give a $1,000 a year professional development stipend. And so this is $1,000 that can't be used on program. It can't be used for your salary. It's only for you to develop as a social entrepreneur. And so... Um, Fellows use this for all different sorts of learning experiences. Some go to conferences, some take classes, um, some you know buy course material. It's really meant to help you um, become the best leader of your organization that you can be. Um, additionally, we have access to conferences as a benefit for all of our fellows. And so once a year, we bring um, 
the current fellow classes all together. Um, we fly everybody to one location and spend four days together just sort of learning from each other, sharing challenges, um, teaching you know, small seminars to each other, um, and additionally uh, meeting with organizations that uh, might be valuable contacts for our fellows. And so we hear from a lot of our fellows that that's actually one of the biggest values of the Echoing Green Fellowship, even greater than the money that comes with it, um, the access to this network of uh, fellow entrepreneurs. We also provide technical support and we try to help foster pro bono partnerships um, to help our fellows organizations really progress to the next level. Um, and so this might be in a number of different areas. Um, we might help a fellow on their marketing, their social media. We might help them develop a governing board. We might help them with staffing or HR issues. Um, to the extent that we're able, either with in-house capacity that we have amongst our staff, or if there's an issue that we're not able to help with, we do our best to find other smart people or smart organizations in our network who we can connect a fellow to so they can get the advice and the help that they need um, to continue to grow their organization. And then lastly, um, one of the other primary benefits we give is access to a community of local like-minded social entrepreneurs. And we really think of um, the Echoing Green Fellowship as becoming a member of a community um, because it can't, being a social entrepreneur can definitely be a very lonely process. And so we hear from a lot of our fellows that it's really valuable to come together with other people who are working on the same issues, facing the ch same challenges, and um, going through the same things. And so some of that uh, support happens at conferences around the year. Some of it happens, you know, over email or over Skype. Oftentimes fellows visit each other and might even um, collaborate on a project together. Um, but we've really seen a lot of um, exciting and a lot of the most encouraging things come out of that support um, between fellows who are active fellows as well as the larger alumni network of uh, over 500 uh, projects that we've funded over the years. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we place such an uh, importance on the conference and the face-to-face -face time amongst fellows because there's just so much learning and so much knowledge there. So if we can get the next slide. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the evaluation criteria. When we're going through applications, what is it that we're looking for? Um, and I'll break this into two parts. One is what we're looking for in terms of the individual, and then the other is what we're looking for in terms of the organization. So on the individual side of things, um, we often talk about how you know we're really funding individuals and we're looking for um, individuals who sh are going to be you know the next great leaders of uh, social enterprise um, and what does that actually look like um, one of the things that we're looking for is um, a sense of purpose and a sense of passion so we want to know why is it that you care deeply about this issue that you're attacking or this community that you're working with um, we want you to help us understand what experiences um, compelled you to start this organization and to apply for an Echoing Green Fellowship. Um, it's really important to us that we get a strong sense of um, how your personal story and um, the moment of obligation to work with this community or on this issue um, how that's connected to you know your talents and your qualifications. We're looking for you know incredibly passionate individuals who are really closely connected to uh, the work of their organization. Um, one of the other things we're looking for is people who are incredibly resilient. Um, you know I don't think it's any secret that social entrepreneurship is really tough. Um, all of our fellows face uh, 
serious obstacles on a regular basis to accomplishing the work that they're trying to accomplish. And so we want to know what you're going to do when you face one of those serious obstacles. Um, and part of that is letting us know how in the past you've shown the capacity to bounce back from challenges and even the ability to foresee challenges before they happen. So another thing that we're looking for is um, strong leadership skills. We're looking for people who are really um, going to shape the social impact sector and inspire others to action. Um, so we want to know what is it um, in your personal qualities that qualifies you to lead, lead an organization towards um, the ambitious goals that you've set out? Um, what skills do you have? What um, have you worked on in the past? Or um, what experiences have you gone through that are going to help you to succeed in this endeavor? Um, and it's also helpful to know if you have experience in this specific ge geographic region as a leader. Um, that's definitely something that's important to us. And one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar today is because we're lo really looking to expand the number of uh, fellows who we have who are local leaders in their communities in developing countries. And so the, the last criteria on the individual side is the ability to attract resources. And so we really want to know um, how you're going to enlist others to your cause. Um, and so there are some people who just have the ability to attract, whether it's money, whether it's people volunteering their time or coming to work for them, um, any number of resources, they really have that ability to make other people care about an issue the way they care about an issue. And we've found that these sorts of people make very successful um, Echoing Green Fellows and social entrepreneurs. So that's another quality that we're looking for. Um, and I think just more broadly on the individual side of things, we want to know, you know, how does this work excite you? What keeps you motivated every day? Um, how are you constantly learning, reinventing, exploring new areas, trying new approaches? Um, and we want you to, um, you know, help explain why uh, others are confident in you and why we should um, you know, be confident in your ability to really make lasting change. So moving over to the organizational side of what we're looking for, um, there's a few things um, that we look for in each application. The first is um, we're looking for innovative ideas. So we don't want, um, we're looking to fund projects that aren't just the same approach in the same place, things that have been done before. We want something that's new, something that's different, something that really hasn't been tried before that's going to, you know, turn things on their head a bit. Um, next, we're looking for um, in people who are attacking important issues, so an issue that really matters to the world. Um, something that is going to, you know, have a deep impact and really um, change things in the field and in the, the location that you're working in. Um, and so that kind of leads into the next uh, criteria, which is the potential for big, bold impact. And here, we want to know how big of an impact is it is that you're aiming to achieve. And it might be that it's very small in the short term. You know, you might only be serving a small population next year maybe over the next five years or the next 10 years, um, it's really going to be something that um, you know, grows and scales and something that has the possibility to really be a game changer. Um, and so it might even be that it's not directly affecting um, as many lives, but it might be such an important example of something that's new and innovative that once you're able to prove it out that maybe lots of other people could adopt this approach. Um, and then the last criteria here is a good business model. And so here, we're getting into a little bit more of the nitty gritty of starting up a new organization. We want to know that um, you've really thought through what it takes to start up a new organization and so that you've given some thought to what your budget might look like, that you've given some thought to what sort of staff you're going to need, what sort of um, other resources you're going to need, what sort of timeline you'd like to roll things out in. Um, 
some sort of an idea of your plan for growth. These things by no means need to be fully fleshed out. Um, you know, we're looking for people with good ideas, and those ideas might still be at a very early stage. Um, but we want to know that you've thought about it and that, um, you know, that groundwork is starting to be laid. That might not be a fully fleshed out budget, but we want to have at least some of the details. And when you see the application, um, you know, you'll see that some of the questions start to get into that business model a little bit. So now I'll pass it back over to Erica to talk a little bit about the timeline for the application. Great. Thanks, Nate. Um, so as you can see on this slide, we have phase one, which opens on Monday. Um, we're pretty excited about that. And hopefully you were able to um, view the questions online. And uh, I think the best advice that, that we've gotten from past fellows is to really take the time and have people read your application and read your answers and make sure that they get what you're doing, especially somebody who maybe doesn't know what you're doing. Um, having them read your answers and tell you what uh, your project is all about and if that's right, then you probably did it a good job. So um, you do have, as you can see, a little over a month to put your application in and it's through an application website. So if you do have limited internet access, I would suggest that you uh, download the questions on online, work on it through the Word document, and then um, when you're ready, then you can just log into the website and copy and paste the uh, answers into the fields. Um, that's probably the best way to do it if you're um, if you have limited access. Um, and so just an overview about what the questions are. Um, we will be asking basic demographic information as well as the essays that you could download already on the website. Um, and finally, a copy of your resume, and that will be um, uploaded just as a PDF document. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, this is what our estimation is of the number of applications that will come through during this phase. Um, last year we had about 2,800 um, and this year this is what we're estimating but you know you you can never tell. Um, so it definitely is an exciting time for us to be seeing this, these many people doing um, doing your great work in, in social change so we're really looking forward to reading all of your applications. Um, so moving on to the semi-final round, um, once we go through all of the phase one applications, the semi-finalists will be notified at the end of January um, whether they make it along to the semi-final round. And if you do not make it, you will also be notified at that time. Um, and at that moment, the semi-final application will be available for you to um, go online and uh, fill out additional essays. Um, and that also includes budget questions, uh, competitive landscape analysis, um, which is where you are comparing your project or idea against what's existing out there, whether it's another NGO or a business or any other organization that's doing similar work. Um, and we will also be asking for letters of reference um, at that time, so individuals and uh, partners will need to be um, submitting letters of reference. Um, and then also during that time, if needed, you may get a phone interview from somebody on the Echoing Green staff. Um, so the application, uh, the questions and, and the essays, um, all the paperwork needs to go in by February 21st. Um, and then between February 21st and probably in the middle of April, um, we'll be doing a very deep due diligence round for the semifinalists for those between 200 and 300 applicants at that point. Um, so that's when your references might be contacted and a phone interview might happen. And of course we will, um, we will let you know uh, in advance if those, either of those are happening. Um, and finally, uh, for finalist weekends, we will be flying um, 
between 25 and 40 of the selected finalists to New York, a fully funded trip by Echoing Green um, for three days, May 10th through 12th. And that is when you will be doing your 60 second live pitch as well as going through a series of panel interviews um, with our judges. And after that, the, after those three days, we'll probably have um, some more time for, for final deliberations. And um, hopefully within a month or so, you will hear back whether you are a, um, an Echoing Green Fellow for 2012. So that is uh, the application in a nutshell. It's a very big nutshell. Um, and it's a long process, but we are uh, trying to be very efficient and very diligent about um, who we are choosing for each of these rounds. And um, if you have any questions about this, uh, you can definitely um, uh, submit them either through the question box or um, later I'll, I'll give you one of my colleagues' email addresses and she can um, uh, answer your questions as well. So now is the time where we're going to move on to the interview portion or the question and answer portion. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Kennedy Odede and Jessica Posner of Shining Hope for Communities. Um, Kennedy is a human rights activist, born and raised in Kibera, which is the largest slum in Africa. Um, as the oldest of eight children, he, was, uh, he assumed responsibility for his family at the age of 10. In Kibera, he became a certified HIV AIDS counselor was the community health worker, and ran several slum-wide AIDS education campaigns. In 2004, he founded Shovco, one of the largest community-based organizations in Kibera, and run by residents of the slum. Kennedy is now the co-founder and CEO of Shining Hope for Communities, a nonprofit that works in Kibera to combat gender, gender inequality and extreme poverty. Kennedy has received widespread recognition for his work, He's a 2010 Echoing Green Fellow and also won the 2010 Dell Social Innovation Competition um, and also recently wrote an op-ed that appeared in the New York Times. Um, he's a senior fellow within Humani Humanity in Action and a senior at Wesleyan University. Um, he's 26, speaks six languages, and brings his extensive experience in grassroots organizing as well as passion for social justice and poverty alleviation to his work with Shining Hope for Communities. Um, also joining us today is, Jess, is Kennedy's co-founder, Jessica Posner. Jessica won the 2010 Do Something Award and was named America's Top World Changer 25 and Under live on VH1. Um, Jessica graduated Phi Beta Kappa with honors in African American Studies from Wesleyan University. She's 24 and fluent in Swahili and she lives most of the time in Nairobi. So thank you to Kennedy and Jessica for joining us today. Um, and we'll start with some questions that were pre-submitted from registration and then continue with any relevant questions that were submitted during the webinar. Um, so thank you again, Kennedy and Jessica. And the first question is, um, what did Echoing Green uh, do for you? Um, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm Jessica Posner. I'm Kennedy Odede. And we're so happy to be here. Um, so Equin Green has done so much for us. I think that Equin Green really launched us, Shining Hope, as an organization in terms of providing capacity building support, providing some of the first economic support. But I think the most important thing that Equin Green has done for me is really provided a community of people who are going through and experiencing similar challenges, who we can talk to about what we're, what we're experiencing, who we can brainstorm together. And through that, I feel like I've gotten um, one of the most amazing gifts. Yes. Uh, I'm Kennedy. I think I've learned much more from Equin Green in terms of preparation and mentorship. It is a place whereby you can have ideas and you have someone to call and talk to on what you're working on. So that has been really, really more important than money. So we have received a lot of mental, a lot of support from them. Great, thanks. 
Um, now, what did you uh, what did you wish you knew before starting the fellowship? Um, before starting the fellowship, um, you know, I really wish that I had had, I guess, a better understanding of just all of the, the complexities of setting up, and we're a nonprofit organization, and so there's so many legal accounting and other structures that really just take so much of your time dealing with details, and so sometimes I wish I had, I had learned more about that, but um, what I'm so happy after getting the fellowship is I really feel like I got the support to, to navigate those, those difficulties. Yeah. <clears throat> Coming from Kibera, it was really difficult to, to learn more because our organization started from informal to formal. So that was a really big transition and I wish I could have been in touch with other people who run organizations like mine to get a lot of support. Like there's a problem with the financial support this guy said and how to get around. So that's really, really hard and I, we, we didn't really expect it. Yeah. So it's something that I think is good to to do more research to, to, and to ask more questions from other people. And I wish there was another group like this that can have, that we can ask questions, like now we can really do it now, you know? So I think it's really, really, really important. Yeah, I think we also, um, we're a very grassroots organization. We work very locally in Kibera, although our intervention is, um, is very innovative. But I think that I, we were almost didn't apply for the Echoing Green Fellowship because we thought that our work was was too specific and that it was too um, local in a certain way and that that wasn't what Eklund Green was looking for. So I wish I had known that, that that wasn't the case because I would have written my application a lot earlier. <laughs> yeah, so Jess is definitely right. Um, we are looking for a variety of, of, problem, or of approaches to problems, um, whether it's local or uh, global type approach, you know, I think the big thing is innovation and um, uh, a strong individual. Um, so what, what Kennedy mentioned of, of reaching out to other people who are doing similar work and asking them, you know, how did they get to where they are now and um, figuring out what the steps are to get there. And also if you can find somebody to be more of an informal mentor in your field um, and, and get them to read your application, maybe that would be, that would provide some good insight into um, maybe places where um, you need to strengthen your application or strengthen your model. So it could be a, it could be a really great process for, for all of you. So great. Um, the next question is, what did you find particularly challenging in your field? Um, I think that's something that I really am always thinking about and kind of struggling with is, with, is that I am obviously American, uh, although I've lived in and out of Nairobi over the past five years, and I'm very committed and a part of the community that I work in. But I think I'm always really thinking about my position and sort of my representation and how, I, um, how that intersects with the community that I work with. And so I think that's one of the challenges that the whole development sector really faces is, is really making partnerships that work and partnerships that are real partnerships that have equality, that have a, where both people have a voice and are coming together to share their skills and their knowledge. And that makes the whole program better. Great. And Kennedy, um, how did you maybe address any obstacles that you faced as a Kenyan in social entrepreneurship? Uh, this is very interesting. And first of all, well, in Kenya, it was really difficult to understand what I was doing. I saw myself as a social movement leader. And I, when I came to the U.S., I realized that what I was doing is also part of social entrepreneurship. So and it was really kind of a challenge because of the system. I think Kenya is still very, in terms of very young, to these kind of things, and we are kind of coming up with it. And it was really, it was really really challenge because I also felt there's a cultural difference, you know, whereby sometimes it's difficult to understand the other side culture. And somehow, honestly, I think it has been occupied by the the Americans, you know. So it's really, really hard, but 
I, and I, as I said, I didn't see myself as a social entrepreneur, but so it's something that we have to believe in what you are you are working on and how you define it yourself, yeah. And that's why I really love Equine Green because they just help me do what I'm doing better, you know. So it's, it's kind of really challenging. We're coming from developing country to really. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Kennedy makes a great point. I, the um, the label social entrepreneur is certainly a, uh, a vast and, and can apply to many different um, personal interpretations to what it means. So, um, you know, if you don't take that as, as what you think you are and you're more of a social movement leader like Kennedy, um, it still could be right for you to, to apply for Echo and Green. Um, we're pretty loose in our translation of it anyway. Um, so to that end, to maybe address the obstacles or in general, um, what were some of the opportunities or resources that you found um, to be very useful when you were starting up your enterprise? Yes. <clears throat> I personally, I really, I, I felt that the world kind of were really willing to support the young entrepreneurs. That's something I've learned in America. And my connection with the grassroots was something really, really important. And I felt I could be able to scale up a little bit because of that connection of the scattered level network. And another thing was really resourceful, I don't want to just be honest with you. I felt it was really important for me to work with Jessica as a way whereby I was, as I said before, I didn't really understand the American side, but I was occupying and really getting so well on the, in Kibera, you know? So both of us kind of became support to, to, to each other. Yeah, I think that the greatest resource or opportunity that has continued to fuel our work are the people. Um, in Kibera, whose ideas are the basis for our projects and for what we do. And so I think that that was what personally inspired me um, to start doing this work when I first met Kennedy um, and started working with him. And then I think that's really what, what continues to, to make it successful today is that people know the solutions to their problems, they just need resources to implement them. And I think that we also we're able to do a lot on not very little, and I think that that's another thing that's been really helpful is that we really temper our expectations. If we get you know a lot of funding, great, we can do more, but if we don't, we can still do a lot. Cool, thanks. Um, so what were maybe any specific things? Who did you talk to? What did you read? Um, and what did you learn uh, in this startup phase? Um, so I really believe, I love reading memoirs and novels and sort of mem memoirs of people who inspire me um, in some way. And then I also think the most helpful people I talked to were other Echoing Green fellows. Um, there were a couple of fellows that we had talked to about the process, and people are so generous with their time and with their knowledge. And so if you reach out to people, um, I think that they're, this is a really open, supportive community where people are more than happy to, to share what they know because somebody shared it with them. And I think just in general, having a mentor, having someone that you can call when you're having a particularly challenging day. Um, I know that we, we edited our application probably for about a month. We probably went through 50 drafts of our Equine Green application, and we showed it to a ton of different people and got so many different reactions and so many different responses. And it's so challenging because you have so few words to get your, your message across. And so I think the more people you can have read your application and give you feedback, the better prepared you'll be to sort of think about all the holes in, in, in what you're proposing. Yeah. I, I think the most important thing was that I have to be motivated. I have to know why I was doing what I was doing and have to feel inspired. And honestly, I felt through working in the streets of Kibera, my community, and I thought of something that I can do. Although there, are a lot of, there was a lot of obstacles that people make you that you cannot make anything, you know? And, but I realized that the only people I should, re, I should associate with were the people who are kind of were doing social change. 
people could give me advice, people could make me believe in myself. Because sometimes in this field, you will find people tell you like, oh my God, you are crazy. You do really? You are now waste your life on that? So that's what I, I do with challenge. So I realize that the more you associate with people who are doing kind of the same thing, and I used to look for advice. One of them, for example, was Sasha, you know? Sasha used to be an Econ Green fellow, and I knew he has connection with Kenya, and I could talk to him, ask him questions, he could challenge me, you know? And also, that was really, really helpful. And yeah. yeah, and personally, I do a lot of readings, as Jessica said, memoirs of the great people, women and men that I admire, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that I think something else to really help is, is talk to someone who doesn't believe in what you're doing and someone who has a lot of questions about your idea because when you talk to them, um, you'll you'll get a lot of, like, I think that for us, the, I mean, obviously we're really happy that we got the fellowship and are part of this community, but I think that also the process of applying for Equine Green can be incredibly useful. And so if you approach it from that point of view and say you really want to think through all of the, the different dynamics and aspects of your organization. And so really having someone who challenges you and says, well, have you thought about this? How are you going to deal with this? This probably won't work. Or how will you, um, how will you kind of mitigate this problem was also really helpful just in our own thought development. Great. Thanks. Um, so the next question is uh, for many applicants, and I'm sure a few who are on this webinar right now, their initiatives are still in the idea phase. So how can they best demonstrate their potential to lead their organization and carry out its mission if there isn't any program on the ground? Uh, okay, let me try to answer this. We have all to accept that even building a house, which is a solid house, it has to come from imagination. So imagination is very, very important. And don't be scared. Put ideas down. Write them down. and Try to challenge yourself. You know what are the obstacles? What do you think? Are you gonna get there? You know those kind of things. And then there's everything comes must come from something. You know, and then from there it will be much more easier. So and you have to know that during the beginning there's a lot of challenges that you really face, but an idea is worth than nothing. And I think that also um, in your application, just demonstrate your what is if you haven't started anything demonstrate why you think you're going to be able to execute your idea so who do you know on the ground what is uh, how are you integrated into this community why should people trust you um, why will people go along with your idea what have you already tried and I think if you can sort of show the evolution of how you came up with your idea because um, probably you've you you arrived at this idea from experiences or things that you observed or gaps that you saw or experienced in a system. And so if you can really identify that you've been really thoughtful about it and that you've really tested different elements of it and that you have the people um, invested in, in, in implementing it, I think that's very powerful. Great. Um, and one question and a few more questions that are actually coming in through the sidebar. Um, did you partner with other organizations once you started Channing Hope? Okay. Okay. Why, why, before I started Channing Hope, we, I had to ask myself, why am I starting it? And why am I doing reputation? You know, what, some, what some other people have done. So in my community, I realized that the challenges that we were facing, and they were not, honestly, they were not really addressed in a local way, you know, from the bottom up. Up, you know, everything kind of came out from above, you know, from up. So there was a there was an hungriness of people willing to do something, you know. So I saw an, an idea that we can bring change and something positive must happen, you know. Yeah, and what I what 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 I've done mostly was more to contact other people for when I came to the U.S. was how they go about it, how do they go about fundraising, how do they go about applying to these things like Equine Green, those kind of things, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I think that there are sort of two pieces. I think the first, I mean, Kennedy really started Shining Hope based on his, his feeling that there was a need for a new organization and that our mission couldn't be accomplished through the premise of an organization that already existed. So that was sort of where we got started. After that, 
Um, we've definitely partnered with different organizations as we execute um, both in Kenya and all around the world. As we run a school, a health clinic, we partner with education institutions, we partner with health, the health sector. Um, so I definitely think that partnerships are important in being able to leverage your impact and make it go further. Great. Um, and another question, where was Shining Hope in terms of the stage of the organization um, when you were applying for this fellowship? Um, what have you already done? Um, maybe a, a stage of your fundraising or programmatic stage? So Shining Hope had actually existed in some form for about five or six years by the time that we applied for the fellowship because Kennedy founded Shining Hope in 2004 and we applied in 2010. Um, for a lot, a lot of that time, it was very grassroots and informal. There was a lot of programming, but there was no infrastructure to support it. Um, then when we applied for the fellowship, we had started the Kibera School for Girls, which is sort of the center of our program. We hadn't started sort of all of the, all of the other services and a lot of the infrastructure that we built around it, but we definitely had um, a lot on the ground. In terms of fundraising, we're still pretty early on in our in our fundraising process. We had definitely fundraised some money in order to get that far, but um, I think that we we're pretty far along in terms of our just kind of program setup and networks on the ground, but still definitely young in terms of our like organizational infrastructure. So Jessica brings up a good point that I think is a point for clarification. Um, when Echoing Green says that we're looking for startup phase organizations and on the website the eligibility criteria mentions the two-year cutoff, that really is more of a guideline than that is a, a hard date for how long your organization can be in existence. So for example with Jessica and Kennedy, um, you know, the Shining Hope for Communities organization was around for a couple years prior, but it really didn't look like the way um, the plan that Jessica and Kennedy came to us with. That was very much the startup of this, um, of the, the full uh, suite of services that they are offering for the community. Um, so another, another option that, that people um, are coming across is that they were working part-time on this organization for a while and now just fully transitioning into working on it full time and, and really giving um, all that they have to, to scale up or to, to really um, put everything they have into the organization. And that, I think, counts as, as still being part of the startup phase. So I think it's really um, uh, a little subjective on, on how you think that um, you, you as an organization, you as a leader of this organization um, can use the benefits of the fellowship uh, as well as um, uh, network with the people who are in your cohort um, who are in kind of the same phase uh, of the organizations. So if they're all, if you guys are all roughly along the same lines of, of in terms of the startup phases, then, um, then you'll get the most out of the experience. And so that's why we're looking for um, loosely interpreted startups. Um, I think we'll, we have one time, time for one more question. Um, maybe uh, Jess and, and Kennedy, can you, can you, um, sorry, I'm just looking at this. Um, can you talk about how you work with uh, the government, the local government? Yes. You have to know Kibera first is an informal settlement, which doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't really get formal support from the government. But the idea is this. Uh, with people that are to blame the government for not providing the basic necessities. But when, when we started from zero, we now have a health center that the government of Kenya is really, through the Ministry of Health, is providing the family planning, you know, is providing vaccination. They're also providing uh, a lot of things. They're really supporting us. So in, in, in a way, we are working with the government. You know, you get that kind of support. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and one last question. Um, Jess, how did you come to Africa? Um, so I came to Africa, actually, I was still in school and um, studied abroad on a program in Kenya um, 
I didn't really have any plans or aspirations to do anything like what I'm doing now, but I was really interested in, um, in theater and how theater could, could interact with communities to make social change. And so I really just came to learn and observe and ended up meeting Kennedy and we started working together and that one thing sort of led to another and here we are. <laughs> Great. All right. So that's, um, first of all, thank you, Jessica and Kennedy, for, for being candid and open with um, everybody here on the webinar. I'm sure, like, like me, everyone appreciates um, you spending some time with us. And um, we will follow up. I think if there are any specific questions um, to Jessica and Kennedy, um, they can be uh, filtered through us. And you guys all have my email and feel free to ask any questions to me, or um, more guidance is available here on this slide. Um, so as you can see, the application questions are there. There's more frequently asked questions on the FAQ page. Um, and then finally, if you have any other questions, you can email my colleague Rebecca, and her email is down at the bottom of the screen, rebecca at echoinggreen.org. Um, so we look forward to seeing your applications. Again, it opens next Monday, um, and uh, that is it. <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, we'll leave you with a little picture of Vicky Barra School for Girls, um, and uh, hopefully um, this gave you enough information to, to apply, and otherwise, again, we welcome your questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.